our, our thoughts, Lord, our lives over to you, Lord, uh, in worship, Lord, in praise and worship, Lord. And we come, Lord, worshiping you with our very lives, Lord. And even as we are reminded in the book of Romans that we ought to live our lives as those living sacrifices, Lord, holy and pleasing unto you, uh, this being our reasonable service of worship, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that we can worship you, Lord, not only with this music, Lord, not only with our lips, Lord, but with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, Lord. We desire to be peoples worshiping the true and the living God, Lord. And we thank you for this evening, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity you give that we might come to worship you, Lord, through the sweet times of fellowship, the prayer we enjoy with one another, Lord, just the hanging out and the talking story, Lord, and the little chit-chat, Lord, what a blessing it is, Lord, uh, just to be in your house and to be with your people, Lord. And we thank you for your faithfulness and love, Lord. And we pray, Lord God, that you might continue to pour out richly in our gathering, here in our midst, Lord, moving and ministering, touching our hearts and lives where we need your touch, Lord, your encouragement. We pray, Lord God, that uh, as you fill us, Lord, afresh this night, Lord, that we might overflow with the love of Jesus Christ and the moving of your Spirit, Lord, as we come into contact with those around us, Lord. We pray just an infectious spreading of your love in these last days, Lord. And we do thank you, Lord. <clears throat> we do praise you for your faithfulness and love, Lord. Bless us now as we continue to worship you through the study of your word, Lord. And again, we thank you just for this beautiful evening, Lord, uh, and the opportunity we have to gather. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen and amen. amen. Hey, praise the Lord, guys. Good to, good to see you folks and glad to be out here. We're actually going to continue our study in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 tonight. And uh, what a blessing it is as we uh, kind of just take a little break from the Old Testament. I know that I told you guys I wanted to go through some of the, uh, the, the, the minor prophets in the Old Testament, but we'll pick up uh, there. But I think it's a good time that we can come high about. Praise the Lord. It's a great time for us to just take this little sidebar <coughs> into the book of uh, First Thessalonians. And last week we, we left off in First Thessalonians 2 where, um, where Paul declared to the church, you are our glory and joy. He ended off there uh, just saying and declaring, uh, you are our glory and joy. And I think uh, what a great thing it is, what a blessing to think and to know as we seek the Lord in worship and in fellowship, in prayer and praise, guys, our lives become not only a glory and joy for those around us. And I hope that that's the case, the true fact. I hope they're not, they're not saying, oh, that Russell, he's such a blankly blank kind of guy. He's such a lousy guy. And, you know, but you, you like to think that, you know, for people around us, our lives become a glory and a joy for those around us. But, but even more so, guys, that, you know, we might be that glory and, uh, and joy for God himself. And that in our lives, he is well pleased because, you know, he's doing a good work. He's begun a good work in us. And what we, we really want to do is yield our lives to him and allow him to be glorified in us and through us. But for Paul and his team of church planners, guys, and builders, uh, it, was, uh, uh, it wasn't all easy, guys. It wasn't easy peasy. It wasn't smooth sailing. And I know that you guys can uh, identify with this. Because as Paul and his, you know, his guys, his band of merry men went their way, it wasn't all easy for them. It wasn't all uh, ice cream and, and, and soda pop and cotton candy and all that good stuff. Uh, they experienced much pushback uh, from the sources outside of their control. And you know, the enemy doesn't like us as we move ahead. The enemy doesn't like us as we say, hey, we want to repent from our old lifestyle. We want to turn from that lifestyle. We want to turn to him. It's not that uh, uh, he doesn't like it when we say, hey, Lord, we want our lives to come for things eternal in the hearts and lives of those around us. We want to be good witnesses. We want to be good examples to our family members, our loved ones, the kids around us, our neighbors, our co-workers. But, you know, it, it, it really... Uh, uh, it really comes from sources outside of control that seeks to turn us away, turn us aside, and stymie us from that, uh, the work that God has begun. The book of Acts becomes a fascinating narrative 
of what went on, guys. And you know, just uh, just beginning our study here in First uh, Thessalonians two twenty, for you are our glory and joy. We're back. Uh, we're back to Acts chapter sixteen, where we again find Paul at the center of controversy. Acts chapter sixteen. And I know that we went through this before, you know, a few weeks back, guys, but I just felt that it just bears, uh, bears for us to take a second look around at Acts chapter 16. Where we again find Paul really in the heart of, of trouble, of, of, of controversy. And you know, if we live our lives with Jesus Christ, guys, if we walk in the world, a lot of times our lives will be controversial. A lot of times our lives will be contrary to where the world is going and what the world is doing. And of course, we don't want to be um, poor witnesses, argumentative, or uh, being uh, uh, holier-than-thou type of Christians, but we want uh, 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 our lives to uh, maybe make some controversy as far as people, you know, where their thoughts are, where their mind is, and where their lives really are at. Paul, having rebuked the spirit of divination at, uh, at work in a certain slave girl, uh, were charged with throwing the city into confusion. Acts chapter 16, starting in 21. Uh, for these men are proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. And the crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off of them and proceeded in, uh, to order them to be beaten with rods. And when they had afflicted many blows upon them and threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely, and he having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. The pushback we see here may be uh, much more subtle today in the life of the believer, guys. You know, as we, as we see it, as we think of being beaten with rods, as we see him being thrown into prison, uh, it's much more subtle in the life of the believer today, especially here in the United States. In parts of the world, hey, guys are giving up their lives. In parts of the world, people are being jailed. In parts of the world, people are, are, are facing physical persecution, as we see in the book of Acts here. But here in the United States, life is, uh, life is a little bit more subtle. And funny, we're talking about having the Ten Commandments in school. Uh, just today or yesterday, I believe today, there was another shooting in a school. Two kids killed and I believe about 15 wounded. And you know, here's a 15 year old kid. How does he get a handgun? And how crazy it is to think that he goes to school and he starts shooting his friends and so on and so forth. On the news tonight, uh, a father showed a picture of his young daughter. But uh, the sad part is, I believe that the person who took that picture, another student, was shot just a few minutes after that. You know, and he was just thankful that his daughter was uh, shot also, but having a chance of recovering. I'm not sure about that other young lady, if she's wounded or what. But you know, I, I, I mentioned that, hey, I, I remember, um, I might be dating myself, but I remember when we were kids, we had the Ten Commandments in school. And the Ten Commandments stood in back of that blackboard that we faced every morning. And I remember the second grade reading those Ten Commandments, not really knowing about it, not really thinking about it, but it was always before us. You know, thou, you know, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not have other gods. You know, it, it kind of set the tone of the school. You know, we were kind of stiff, you know. And the, the worst thing we could do was, you know, get uh, uh, running in the halls or disobeying the, the teacher. I know that I got in trouble. I had my magnifying glass and uh, I was trying to burn a leaf on my teacher's chair during recess. <laughs> I said, well, here's a handy place. I can, uh, I can just burn this leaf with my magnifying glass. And just so happened, it was the teacher's chair. And I didn't do it you know, purposely. But you know, inside you know that, hey, you got to be good. The, the, the Ten Commandments said, hey, you got to be good and fly right. But you know, the kids grew up today with no parameters, no, uh, nothing that says, uh, uh, there's there's a higher power. Nothing that says that we should live within the rules of a, of a good society, a good and moral life. Uh, and, and they said that, hey, why don't we have the Ten Commandments? Levon and Byron said, why don't we have the Ten Commandments? I said, because as Christians, we don't have a voice. They go, how come, uh, how come all the Satanists can have all these classes and their sayings in school? It says that everybody else 
can do anything they want, but if you, you're a Christian, you fall into another class of people. And we're not listening, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. You cannot say a prayer after the football game, and all of this, and before the football game. But you know, here's, here's that subtle form of pushback uh, today in the life of the believer. But much more, it could be our comfort zone. We might be, uh, um, we might be in, in prison, our own prison, because hey, I'm in my comfort zone, I have my own personal space, I don't want to make any waves, or oh, my reputation as being a good guy at the working place or at the gym or at the, uh, uh, at, uh, the place of uh, fellowship or the place of having fun at the golf course, whatever it might be, uh, may be at risk at the thought of being, hey, you're too religious, you're too preachy, man. You know, a little bit of religion is good, but hey, don't get in my face, man. Don't, don't, don't tell me about it. Uh, don't be fanatical in our faith or in your faith. But here, a little, a, a little, uh, a little bit of, uh, of uh, religion is good. But the pushback will never say or use the word uh, compromise. Another, another thing is compromise. If the pushback from the world, the, the pushback on our flesh, is compromising our value, our faith, our compromising in the Word of God. Compromise might be saying, hey, we're cutting corners. Compromising might be saying is, okay, I can do this, I can do that. I can, I can have that little uh, fling. I can have that little affair. I can have that little fling with the world or an affair with the world as we get outside of what God's Word says. You know, these are the things that saying, yeah, a little bit of religion is good, but yeah, a little bit of compromise, it's okay. But this is what the world will do to nullify our witness that we have in the world. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's like that we go, but we have no power. Our words, we have a lot of words, but our lives don't declare the power of God to a world lost and dying without God. And, and in that, we become as those thrown into the inner prison, our feet fastened in the stocks. Uh, it, it, it might be, oh, I'm tired. It might be, I pray and read at home. I need my rest. I need my exercise. I need some fun. And you know, it, de it depends where your fun is. It depends where your release is. It depends if you're at a point where Paul says, yeah, body exercise, you know, profits little. But it's the, the exercise of the Word of God and the exercise of the walking with the Spirit. The, the, the spirit is, is good. I, I, I'm not saying don't go exercise because I went for a walk before church tonight. I went for a walk. I jumped in the shower. I told Avant, oh, I feel good, you know. And, and uh, it, it's, it's something good because uh, I, I just says, I was watching the commercial, Body in Motion Stays in Motion. So I said, get off that couch and get, go, go for your walk around the block. <laughs> get the blood circulating. And she just, she say, oh, you're not slinging mud on the construction site. You're just riding around in your truck or sitting at your desk. And I say, oh, man, well, you know, I don't climb as many buildings or I don't climb as many cranes or I don't get up on many uh, tugs and barges as I used to. And, you know, she's, she's right. But, you know, I'm riding around uh, most of the time or riding the desk. But, you know, the thing is that the, ex the, the, the spiritual exercise that God has. It says that we stay in fellowship. It says that we stay in communion. It says that we consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. The onus is on us, guys. How do you consider to stimulate your brother to love and good deeds? You gotta be interacting with their lives. You gotta be having some contact. You gotta be having something to say because God has a gift that he's given to you and he wants you to use that gift to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. You cannot really just say, hey, I want to be stimulated, Lord. I want, I want to be the target of the love and good deeds. Me, 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 gimme, gimme, gimme. And we become these big, fat, little, you know, pew potatoes or, you know, little kids that just say, hey, wah, 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 I want the bottle, you know. But are we giving? <coughs> can we give back? Can we, can we do something to, to uh, stimulate our church family to love and good deeds in the world? It takes time, it takes a little bit of risk, it takes a little bit of chance. Verse 25, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, and that the foundations of the prison house 
were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everybody's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer was, had been roused out of sleep and seen the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do, not, do yourself no harm for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know? God has a way of showing uh, as, as shaking things up, guys. As we saw a couple Saturdays, Saturdays ago, a real scary time for many. And you know, we've been talking about that and you know, how, uh, how we responded, how people responded and so on and so forth. But the reality, uh, uh, the reality uh, is a sizable uh, earthquake off the coast of Alaska happened, and I didn't know it. I didn't get the signal. Our sister said that oh, her phone was buzzing, you know, in the middle or early in the morning. A tsunami warning. Uh, warning. The reality is, it, it 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 happened, and just so happens, you know, this notable quake off the Big Island also took place in a re relatively close time frame, right after the Al Alaska earthquake, guys. And nobody really felt that. It was four point something, but it was off the coast of the Big Island. I'm sure some of the Big Island guys felt the rocking and the rolling. <laughs> uh, uh, a day or so later, a huge volcanic eruption took place in the Philippines, sending ash about three and a half miles into the sky. And this, uh, this um, volcano is going off. Things are shaking. Uh, and it's just in our part of the world, guys. It's just in this Pacific region. We're in this region again, the Pacific Rim, Ring of Fire. We, we're right in the heart of it. We have the active volcanoes here, but we have all these, these seismic occurrences. Alaska, South America, again, we've had notable tsunamis all come from these areas uh, in, in recent history. And like the Philippian jailer, he was roused out of his sleep by the shaking. I really believe that God is trying to rouse people out of their sleep. Hey, even for we as Christians, we can get so comfortable. We can get so uh, lackadaisical and so at ease that we kind of forget, hey, God, God, God is not coming. Well, you know, we, we kind of think that, hey, we've been, Pastor Chuck's been teaching us that for the last 25 years. Same thing with Pastor Bill. Now we're going to hear it from you uh, so that God's return is imminent. But he's right there. He's right at the cusp of coming, guys. And, you know, we believe that it could happen any time or day. And God is gracious as he desires that hey, all these people around us, you know, so many have no knowledge of the, the love of Jesus Christ. And they're good families, they're good parents, they're good husbands and wives, they're good kids, but they have no knowledge of, of Jesus. You know, some of them, they're caught up in their lifestyles, they're in their garages, they're partying, they get all the football games, they got the big screen, they got the beer on tap, and the hooli hooli pig going, and the barbecue going, and all this and that, but they're just getting caught up and just turned away from the love of God. Uh, like that Philippian jailer, he was roused out of his sleep by his shaking. And sometimes we're gonna shake things up, guys. And you know, for, I, again, I gotta say that Hawaii, we've been so uh, blessed with God's graciousness because we've had so many near misses. But you know, when is the next big uh, a tsunami coming? It's like being in Hilo. You, you're at the Hilo Seaside or one of those hotels. You look up on the wall and they have the mark and they said that, oh, this is where the tsunami came up to in 1940-something or 1950-something. It's within recent history that uh, the tsunamis have hit Hilo and, and uh, places like that, Lapa Hoi Hoi. But I believe God gives time and time and then more time and opportunity for people to wake up from the slumber, as comfortable as it may be, on your silly pastopedic. <laughs> Some of you might be thinking, hey, so I can be on my silly pastor feeling. Why, why, why I gotta listen to you? God is giving a wake up call to many, including us, uh, 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 including us as church guys, that we shouldn't slumber or become comfortable or lackadaisical in our work and relationship with them and our relationship with the world. We shouldn't get so comfortable in this world, but we should know that if Jesus is coming, there's a time of judgment coming. And you know, you wouldn't want to fall into the hands of the living God. You want the worst guy that you think, oh, that person is such a blankety blank. 
but you don't want them falling into the hands of the living God and facing that time of judgment. Don't be comfortable, Christians. Don't don't say, oh, I catch them next time. Oh, I catch them on Kilaid. Oh, I listen to Kilaid radio. I get Kilaid radio on, you know. Don't compromise with the world. Don't go there. Verse 31, and believe in the Lord. He says, what, sirs, what must I do? They said, and believe in the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and together all who were, uh, who were with him in his house. And they took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and his, all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them, and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. You know, our own relationship with the Lord brings a newfound ability to minister to those once hostile to the, uh, the Word of God and bringing them to a point of fellowship and communion with God. Guys, no, no matter if we, we might be like Jeremiah, having a ministry for so many years and not having one convert, yet he wept for the lives of the people that he ministered to. And you know, we, we might not seem that we have the greatest thing going on, but our lives, no matter what we say, we think, or the enemy says, oh, you're ineffective. The enemy says, oh, what, why don't you throw the towel in? Oh, just have one, have two, have six, have 12, you know, whatever it might be. Our lives are speak volumes to those around us, they're watching, or, or they're Christians, you know, and, oh, but they're just like us. The Christians uh, uh, that have, because of compromise, have lost the power of their witness. There, there's no power in your life, and uh, and uh, we can we can be highly opinionated, or we can be just saying, "Hey, we trust in God. Hey, we praying about it. Hey, we doing this. We're not condemning that guy because God loves him too." And and uh, you know, uh, the situation will work out. I pray, you know, and. Uh, we see so many volatile situations, how we react to that situation. Yes, I'll pray. I, I love it that you know I have a, my running prayer list. It's just kind of going on and on and on. I just add more and more people on. And, and uh, we just continue to pray for the lives of those around us. Sometimes we, we said, okay, it's time for a text message. Sometimes we say it's time for a call. Sometimes we say, Lord, uh, we commend these guys to you and we move on down the list as we continue to pray for those around us. But uh, again, our lives uh, bring uh, us to a place, it gives us a place of being able to speak into the hearts and lives of those lost around us. And whether they make that decision or they pray the prayer, or they said, hey, they go home and the, the, the Holy Spirit is speaking to them. And, and, they, and, and they say, hey, you know that guy, that Christian, he's right. Well, you know that Christian, there's something different, really different about that person. And, and uh, they begin listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Verses 35 to 40. And when that day come, the, came, the chief magistrate sent their policemen saying, release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying that the chief magistrates have sent to release you. Now therefore come out and go in peace. And, and Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans and have thrown us into prison. But now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed, but let them come themselves and bring us out. And the policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and appealed to them, and when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. And they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, and when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them, and they departed. From being beaten and then incarcerated guys, now to a place of release and exoneration. But, hey, please, you guys, why don't you guys just leave, was the thought. But it's not always the same, you know. Somehow, when you are a worship of God, worshiper of God, things work out to His glory. Guys, I don't know what the, the answer to your situation is because each of us as individuals, we face our own individual situations. We face things that are unique to ourselves. And though the Bible speaks and there's many, many examples, a lot of times it becomes personal to us. Hey, what, what are we going to do? 
somehow when you are a, a worshiper, worshiper of God, a seeker of Him, things work out to His glory. Sometimes at times you're so paralyzed, sometimes all you can do is groan, sometimes all you can do is cry out to Him. And, and God is moving, God is ministering on your behalf as well as mine. We just don't know how things are going to work out. But we're going to just continue to move on in Him. In faith we move on, in faith we go forward, in faith we don't go backwards, in faith we don't stop, because when we stop we are going backwards. In faith we continue to seek Him and to uh, believe and trust in His Word. In faith, even as the enemy comes to rob us of our joy, in faith, even as the world seeks to bring discouragement and heap condemnation upon us, in faith we continue to move out. In faith, Lord, help me pick up my cross, help me to follow after you, uh, even in this dark time. Was the beating and imprisonment pleasant? Hey, just imagine you were beaten with rods. Was the, the prison imprisonment pleasant? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. But in all of this, they kept their eyes on the Lord. You know, whatever we go through, we might not, might, we might be just a punching bag for the world, and we might feel like we're a punching bag of the devil. We might feel that even our loved ones are punching, punching us around. And I'm not, I'm not talking about love. <laughs> I'm posing that question to you guys. That sometimes, you know, we think that hey, even Christians are punching me around. But they kept their eyes on the Lord. In the hardest of times, guys, let's, uh, it's, it's then we see them now giving in. Not giving in, but going on. They weren't giving in. They weren't quitting. They weren't whining. They weren't crying. And so much of the times I can say, oh man, I whine and cry before the Lord, you know. And, and uh, we, 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 we fail miserably. And then we look at the higher standard of the lives and the bar that these guys have set. They were ordinary men like you and I. They weren't super extraordinary or something out of the ordinary, but they were men like and women like you and I facing different types of challenges. It's a different time, it's a different world, uh, but, but the same challenges exist, guys. You know, we, we, we're not in facing prison men and being beaten and, and, and so on and so forth. But the, the point is they kept their eyes on the Lord. It's we see them now not giving in but going on. Chapter 17, and when they have traveled through Am 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 Amphipolis and Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue uh, of Jews. Remember the synagogue was a separate place of worship, separate from the temple, separate from the tent of the meeting. Here you had... Uh, where you had 10 or more Jewish men who were interested in the, uh, uh, the preservation of Jewish customs and learning and uh, obeying the law. These places of worship were often um, uh, sprung up in different cities, in different towns, in Jerusalem, as well as you know, to the outer, outer regions where the temple was not there. You know, the temple was in Jerusalem. So they went ahead and they had, a, they had 10 men gathered. They had formed a place of worship. It was called a synagogue. But these places were often dominated by rabbis who sought to influence the religious thinking of the people. In other words, hey, this is the law. We gotta follow the law. This is the rule and, and so on and so forth. So they wanted to proliferate the word of God. But when, uh, when Paul, we often see, Paul would often go into the synagogue to reason with people, to speak with people, to share the good news of Jesus Christ as we see here. And according to Paul's custom, he went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he's the Messiah, guys, he's the Savior. Paul, you might say, his mindset was changed, guys. His worldview now reveal, uh, revolved around the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of Jesus Christ, guys. He explained, he gave evidence, and we're told as he uh, reasoned with those in attendance, many sincerely seeking God joined in uh, with Paul and with Silas. You know, I, I would dare say that in this world, there are those who are, uh, who are sincerely seeking God here. God, a lot of times guys are reaching out, guys are seeking. They might not uh, have it written on their chest, hey, I'm seeking God. They might not speak it with their words, 
But in their hearts and minds, if they're wondering about the future, they're wondering about the consequences, they're wondering about, hey, what if that was a real nuclear missile coming to us two weeks ago? They're wondering, is, hey, what if, what if uh, a tsunami did come to hit Hawaii? You know, um, one of the brothers say, I live right across the beach. We said that, oh, he might not be living across the beach. He might be on the beach. He might be the beach front. <laughs> what floor are you on, Les? Second floor. <laughs> We better hope that's high enough. <laughs> but it is uh, across the beach now became beachfront because <laughs> because of the tsunami. But guys are wondering, guys are wondering hey, what you know what what it is. You know, guys think that hey hey we, we got hit before. Guys are wondering. They're sincerely seeking God. Verse five says that the Jews becoming jealous, but the Jews. But the Jews becoming jealous and taking some of the wicked men from the marketplace formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. Uh, and, and coming to the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. Guys, jealousy is a powerful motivator. And when you think that the Jews wanted to proliferate their mindset, their views on the following of the law, the giving of the offerings, the giving of the worship service, the burning, the receiving of the, the money donations, and so on. The, the Jews moved into swift action as they saw their beliefs being challenged. And you know, the world is going to challenge you because you know their belief is being challenged. Oh, just be tolerant to what all people accept them as they are. And as you, 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 you're tolerant, hey, they're going to be tolerant to you. Everything is going to be good because we're moving towards world peace. You know, why, why rock the boat? Go church. Being a little religious is good, but not too religious. That's what the world will have to tell you. And good people will tell you that. Hey, just a little bit of religion is okay. Not too much, no. Because you're starting to step on my toes. You know? And, and it's not like we're holier than you or we're better than you. But, you know, we, we are holy. We are set apart unto God's glory, unto His good use. We are vessels set apart for His glory, to bring glory to His name. And sometimes the, the, uh, amidst the glory of the Lord, guys, hey, lives, lives look pretty bad. You know, when the light is shine, sh uh, shown upon that dark place, uh, you begin to see that, hey, man, my life is imperfect, you know, far from perfect. But these Jews were, uh, uh, these Jews were uh, moved into swift action as they saw their beliefs being challenged. Remember, the term Jew is used generally as those in opposition to Christ, and here in the Book of Acts, of those who oppose the apostles and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jews is used kind of in a bad term. It's, it's not the people who are uh, of Judah, the people who are of Jewish descent, because Jew just simply means, "Hey, I come from Judah." which means let him be praised, you know. And, and uh, the, the term Judah is, you know, again, let him be praised, and that's a derivative of, of Judah. But here, Jews are, are, are those who are opposed to the apostles uh, and to the gospel. Verses 6 to 9. And when they did not find, uh, find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men have upset the world. They've come here also. And Jason had welcomed them, and they were all they all had contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received the pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Again, we find opposition and pushback. And you know, here Paul and Silas, they were the main guys, but when they when they reasoned with these guys and these guys believed, hey, they became part of the the, uh, the problem to the Jews. So when you follow the, the unpopular gospel of Jesus Christ, just imagine the pushback, the resistance that you will, you will occur. But I'm just calling us that we might stand firm in our convictions uh, uh, and our love of Jesus Christ. 10 to 12, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of Jews here again, 
Paul went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And many of them uh, therefore believed along with a prominent, uh, a number of prominent Greek women and men. Guys, you know, at, at times uh, uh, the gospel goes out. We might be, some may be so ready to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's like that low hanging fruit. It's like that beautiful avocado that's hanging there. And they're just ready to be picked. And guys are, guys are ready out there, guys. But our lives gotta, gotta count for some power uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the Word of God, guys. Like that low-hanging fruit, ready to be harvested for the kingdom of God. Some plant, some water, some bring in the harvest, guys. Whatever we're doing for the Lord, just know it's not in vain. It's all for the glory of God. So, you know, as we live our lives as Christian believers, as we walk in the light of uh, the, the light of the Lord, as we become not as those holier than thou, but we become as those set apart unto God, uh, not compromising, but not being, you know, telling them, hey, you know, uh, uh, or convincing them, hey, you're going to hell. And, you know, sometimes that might work. But most of the times, hey, you know, I used to see the guys on Fort Street Mall shouting and all that. I kind of just looked out of the way and I keep going. You know, and, and uh, it was that gentle voice, that voice of reason that says, hey, Jesus died on the sin. It, was, it, it wasn't like it. the first guy that came up to me, I gave my life to the Lord. But it was a series of guys that came. And I said, why, why am I meeting all these Christian guys? Why, what, what's the deal with this? And you might be one of those Christian guys in the lives of those who might be around you. Or you might just touch, you might just visit, you might just meet. Oh, my truck just got stolen, I'll say a prayer for you, man. And, and you, you go your way and you fire a prayer up for the guy on my truck just got stolen. There's an old retired guy, that's his only truck. And you kind of think, why would in the world would somebody steal the guy's truck? It's such a piece of junk. And I said, must be some kids that wanted to go joyriding. But it, it was like, hey, he lost his best friend. And I would see him at Target, I would see him at McDonald's eating his cheeseburger inside his old truck. And he just said, hey, I'll say a prayer for you. And, and the next day, you found your truck? Yeah, I was at the airport. <laughs> so I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> but he still got mad. He said, hey, I had to catch the cab down there. I had to pay cab fare. He wasn't saying, hey, I got my truck back. But he said, oh, I had to pay the cab fare. I wish I had 20 bucks and would have given it to him. <laughs> I'll buy him a cheeseburger when I see him at McDonald's. But you know, that just that, that whatever we do, that little word of encouragement, you know, I, 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 you see this guy in the street, you know, feeding the cats, he's the cat man. And then you, you find out, oh, somebody stole his truck, all of a sudden, your heart turns for that cat man, you know. Sometimes guys might be so ready to receive the gospel, guys, and they're just looking for a word of, love, a word of encouragement. Somebody cares, and you know, Jesus cares. Sometimes it's a text message. I just want to say that, you know, you are loved. And you don't know, you don't know why. You never text anybody that, you know, there's a guy on the mainland, you texting, you are loved, and you, you kind of think, hey, does that guy need to know that you are loved and somebody cares? You know, just three lines. Whatever it might be, you know, whatever, you, wherever we go, guys, hopefully we're leaving a, a sweet-smelling fra fragrance of Jesus Christ. 13 to 15, when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea, they came there likewise, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Guys, when something good happens, when we have this mountaintop experience, when something 
God says, hey, that's so good, that's great. You give a word of encouragement, whatever it might be, a word of kindness. You got to pray for that person, whatever it might be. The pushback comes and here it came. They came there likewise, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go uh, as far to the sea and Silas and Timothy remained there. And those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens and received the command to Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible. They departed. Guys, you know, uh, sometimes God moves us around. It might be a different assignment. It might be riding around doing this or that. It might be just meeting, meeting up with someone, some chance meeting. I don't know. You, I have a lot of chance meetings just walking through the hospital. I don't know why. I hated hospitals. I hate dentists. I hate hospitals. And yet, uh, it seems to be the most fruitful place that uh, there's always opportunities because people are hurting. And, and people are wondering, and they say, hey. And if you're carrying a Bible, look out, man. People are going to grab you. So, you know, you want, you're looking for ministry opportunities. Just go walk to the hospital lobby and hang around over there. Do this or do that. And people will come and talk to you. And God will bring opportunities. And opportunities abound not only in the hospital, but out in the highways and byways. You know, the chance meetings. When I go out walking, I don't stop for nobody. I told the guy, I'll pray for you, and you know, I kept going. <laughs> no ground will be happy, you got your truck back in the next day. <laughs> With victory comes the attack. With victory comes the attack. Expect the pushback. If we're moving forward in the Lord, if we know we're gonna have a uh, pushback. If we're compromising and we we living a lifestyle contrary to what the Word of God says. Eh, hey, no problem. The enemy says, eh, hey, let him go. He's going to come, you know, he'll do it to himself, self-destruct. Next week, we're going to pick up, we're going to go in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. As we left off here, we'll pick up uh, Paul's story, uh, or uh, his saga, right there in chapter 3, verse 1, because it's like a continuation.